I do want to say uh, that this is an event that is sponsored by Progressive Democrats of America. It is also sponsored by the Bernie Delegates Network, um, and we are partners in the Bernie Delegates Network with our revolution and Roots Action. Uh, and we have uh, sort of a uh, ongoing partnership as well during this season with People for Bernie and Once Again. I could not be more honored to introduce uh, the person who is going to be emceeing tonight's uh, live stream on Medicare for All and the movement, Medicare for All and the DNC. I've had the pleasure of working uh, closely uh, with Senator Nina Turner over these past few weeks, and it is absolutely inspirational. Um, she really is, as she seems from a distance, just an unwavering advocate for um, just working people, uh, all people, um, people just around the world, actually, and she's a visionary voice, and welcome, Senator Nina Turner. Thanks, Alan, so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and Mike and Catherine, and I know Solomon is in there, Roots Action, Our Revolution, PDA, People for Bernie. Once again, Pack Baby, we are all together tonight. And this is a pivotal moment and a most important time to talk about this issue, Medicare for All. I want to thank Chairwoman Judith, uh, the, the folks in Nevada bringing it on home. You're going to hear from her a little later tonight. But it is very clear that progressives are going to have to be the ones that stand in the ready position for everybody else in this nation, whether they believe in what we believe in or not. Medicare for all is one of those signature issues that I am delighted to be among those who are have drawn a line when it comes to Medicare for all. There's so many people suffering in this nation. They were suffering before the pandemic, but the pandemic has made it crystal clear for those who actually want to see that the way that things have been going in this country, especially when it comes to the commodification of healthcare is not the way to go. If it wasn't clear two months ago, three months ago, four months ago, five months ago, a year ago, if it wasn't clear in 2016, if it sounded as if we were proposing something that was wildly out of order, maybe it should be very clear right now with almost 5 million people who have lost their jobs, even more people have lost their health insurance. And when you couple those people with our sisters and brothers who are already underinsured or uninsured to begin with, when we look at some of our rural areas where they're losing hospitals, where people have to travel an hour, two hours away. I talked to many of these people, Dr. Victoria Dooley, who you're gonna hear from an MD, because there are many doctors, but Alan, we got an MD on here to break this on down for us. And people like uh, Dr. Philip Agnew, I've given him his honorary doctorate degree, but Dr. Philip Agnew, who definitely understands, we were all on that campaign trail and we had an opportunity to talk to people about the suffering in their communities all across this country. We know that it polls well too, across demographics, across whether somebody is a Democrat or Republican, it polls very well. The American people are saying loudly and clearly that they want, that they prefer the federal government to play a stronger role in making sure that everybody has health care. Now, folks wasn't feeling that vibe when we were talking about it in 2016, when Senator Bernie Sanders raised that issue and he raised it very strongly, we did the same thing in 2020. The folks couldn't quite understand. I remember just yesterday, I'm old enough to remember on that debate stage where folks were saying, uh, Medicare for all, who wants it? Or why would we mess with people's employer-based insurance? And then COVID came in and shook the foundation to remind folks who didn't quite understand that this really is the moral issue of our time. And yes, I am using the word moral very deliberately because I certainly believe that it is patently immoral. It was immoral before and it is especially immoral now with the pain that people are losing their lives and their livelihoods that at least one of these parties won't show up for the people. We already have Medicare right now. It's just not for all. Our elders, our seasoned folks, 65 and older, have Medicare right now. So this is not some wild idea. It works, baby. It works. And people need this relief. They need this help. 
Our health is our wealth. There are many variables under the umbrella of wealth and health is certainly one of them. We cannot do any other great thing without being healthy and part of that. It's not just having access, being able to go to a doctor and not have to worry about it, having your dental care, your vision care. Hello, somebody. This is not while every other industrialized nation in the country has universal health care of some type, except for the hegemon nation itself, the United States of America, just even from a competitive edge. Why would we let other folks outdo us like that? Well, something so pivotal. And even the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other of his contemporaries have weighed in on this. They debated Medicare for all decades ago. We almost had it. Maybe we almost had it. And then they just decided politics got in the way and it was laid out there for our seniors, 65 and older. All we saying, let's just go and expand this thing for everybody. Everybody deserves to have health care. Everybody. So with that, you know what? Let's just go and get the MD in. Y'all know where I stand, baby, unequivocally standing up for the people. Let's go and bring the one and the only, the medical doctor hailed from the great state of Michigan, that state up north. I'm from Ohio, y'all. We ain't gonna talk about football. I love me some Dr. Victoria Dooley, baby. We ain't gonna let no football get in the way of that, of that <laughs> black girl magic or that black girl love. And every now and then we gotta go to the island of misfit black girls and we're gonna yes. invite you to the island. Y'all welcome on the island, baby. <laughs> if you believe in what is just, what is right and what is good, you come visit the island a misfit black girl. So I'm bringing in one of the misfit black girls herself, Dr. Victoria Dooley, who was a national surrogate for Bernie 2020. She traveled all over this country. She, she weaved her schedule. She managed her schedule around being able to travel this country to help Senator Bernie Sanders try to win this election in the primary. I am so honored to have been able to forge a strong and beautiful relationship with Dr. Victoria Dooley. She is the real thing, the real deal. And she expresses herself like no other medical doctor I've ever seen on social media. Go ahead and follow a sister, but you won't get the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And she does realize that she's a free black woman in America. Dr. Victoria Dooley. I think she, I love you. I miss you. I miss you. Oh, so good to be with you this evening. So hello, everyone. Um, again, I'm a family medicine physician. So I go to the office every day. I see patients. That's what I do. So I'm talking from experience, um, from what I see and what, from what I hear. And, and it pains me that today, in this day and age, when we are going through a pandemic and people are dealing with all these challenges, that we're calling people and trying to get them to, to follow up with us in the office because the state was closed down for many months and we know people need to see us. And some of the things we're hearing, um, can't come in, lost my insurance. Of course, we're taking care of them, but it shouldn't be like that. Or I uh, lost my insurance, I was able to get some more insurance, but we find out the insurance that they got is not one that we could accept because the insurance is rest restricted to one certain area, one certain city or one certain health system. So this whole nonsense about uh, private healthcare gives you choice. That is a lie. That is a myth. Um, I have people who are coming to see me who lost their employer-based health insurance and they had to switch doctors. They had to switch doctors because they switched insurance and their doctor didn't accept their new insurance. So we have all these, these stressors that we're dealing with every day. Um, as a physician, I'm, I'm having difficulty finding gloves. First it was uh, sanitizer and masks. Now we can't even order gloves because of this pandemic. And so there's all these stressors that we have to deal with. And the very last thing we should have to deal with is, is our health. We need more mental health coverage. We need more health care coverage in this day and age. And we have to, have to, have to stand up to the people in charge and say, how dare you, the people that we elected to represent us, how dare you deny us basic rights like health care? You are killing us. We cannot allow it. This is not a unicorn or a rainbow or pony. Um, this is a basic right that everyone else in the industrialized world has. Enough is enough. The time is now. We cannot wait any longer. And, and so we're losing our health care. And, and what are our elected officials deciding to do? They want to fund COBRA and fatten the pockets of health insurance companies instead of just giving everybody health care. People are losing their homes. And what are they trying to do? They're saying, oh, well, here's some billions of dollars that we're going to set aside to pay for you to have legal representation. And I understand having legal representation is important when you're getting evicted, but why not just give the money to the people who are getting evicted? 
-hmm. Why do you have a simple problem? I'm about to be homeless. The solution is to give them a home, cancel the rent, cancel the mortgage. But they come up with this, oh, let's give some money to the lawyers. There's a simple solution of people being uninsured and underinsured. This is not rocket science. You could ask a five-year-old. You know, there's some people in this country who don't have insurance. What do you think we should do? They're going to say, just give it to everybody. And then they want to say, well, how are we going to pay for that? Nobody says, how are we going to pay for it? Every single time the Democrats and the Republicans vote to increase Trump's war and military budget, no one says, hey, how are we going to pay for that? So we have the money. Instead of giving it to a handful of rich, we need to use it to give it to everyone. And you know, it's really frustrating to me, uh, Senator, because one of the main reasons why we don't have universal health care in this country, besides the money, is uh, racism, basically, okay? We can't give health care to everyone because I don't want somebody who is black and brown to have health care. We can't give health care to everyone because I don't want somebody who is undocumented to have health care. So you don't bite your nose to spite your face. Like, why? We just need to accept, we need to have a greater sense of unity in this country. This whole me, 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 we're brainwashed to believe that the enemy is somebody who's coming here from another country. The enemy is somebody who's black and brown that's taking your job. That we keep our eyes off the real enemy, which is a 0.1%. And we oh have to tell them you cannot have it all. You have to give us basic rights. And we are not going to allow you to continue to kill us. We have to stand up. And so I'm really excited to be here talking about this topic with you this evening. I love you all. I'm going to tell you something. Dr. Dooley is America's doctor. Come on, somebody. Y'all get in that chat. Amen. Mm -hmm. so, that, hello, somebody. She make a fabulous surgeon general. Hello. <laughs> There's bold. You know, we need that kind of boldness. You know, Dr. Dooley, it's, it's, you know, the Democratic Party just took a vote on their platform. Uh, I'm old enough to remember that vote. And, <laughs> um, I think it was 125 no's to 32, 36 yeses. The Democratic Party, the overwhelming majority. I mean, even if you want to do this for political reasons, which I want to put that aside when people die and losing their livelihood, but even if you wanted to just do it for political reasons, the polls show very clearly that Democrats overwhelmingly support Medicare for all. And this is not a radical idea. Matter of fact, we're in the mainstream of what Americans want and, and, and what they need. Now, this ain't it's not about luxury. It's about what they need. And I want to direct everybody's attention to an article that was written by John Nichols, and I think it came out today, and it, the title of it is, and maybe uh, Mike Fox or Alan, you guys can find it and put in the chat, without Medicare for all, this isn't the boldest democratic platform in American history. Now, why, how should people look at the fact that really the poor, the working poor, and the barely middle class basically have very few champions in the elected mm -hmm. space. And why is it from a medical, I mean, you can tell us things that the average person cannot tell us. Why is it so vitally important that we have Medicare for all? And there are doctors like you, they may not be as bold as you and just put it on out there, but there are do other doctors who support Medicare for all. You know, s and um, there are, but uh, a lot of them aren't as vocal as me because this health care is this political issue, right? If you support health care for all, then people assume or you're radical left or you're a Democrat. And, and, the, and it's so infuriating because the radical thing is being an elected official and you telling the people who elected you while you sit there with your health care that you could afford that, no, I'm not going to guarantee that everyone that I represent has health care. That's the radical issue. If they were accepting these money from these millionaires and these lobbyists, and then they turned around and said, we're not going to do what we're not going to represent you after we took your money, what do you think will happen? But they take our vote, and then they look us in the face and say, you know what, when they go to vote on their platform, I'm going to make sure that some of the people that I represent do not have health care. And that is unconscionable. I don't understand how they do this. And it's so important for so many reasons, not only because of it's a basic necessity, it should be a human right. But when we think about something that's health disparities, uh, because I'm very passionate about eliminating health inequality, especially in people of color. Um, and when you look at something like health disparities, every time in this nation where we've done something to ensure more people, whether it be Medicare that we have now or the Affordable Care Act, every single time, there's still a disproportionate amount of poor people of all colors, black and brown people who are left uninsured. 
I don't think that's a coincidence. Call me a conspiracy theorist. That is not a coincidence that every time you expand something, there's still a disproportionate amount of black and brown people left behind. It's because you don't give a damn about them. Because if you did, there's a simple solution. The solution is, like I said, ask any toddler. Some people don't have health care. What do we do? We give it to everyone. Well, how do we do it? Look up north. Look at our neighbors in Canada. Basically, look anywhere. Copy right. their model. Everybody else does it but us. So it's just a, the radical thing is saying that in this great, wonderful nation, we're going to leave anybody uninsured. That is a radical thing, not Medicare for all. Say that, Doc. And before we're going to bring in Brother Agnew, just one more thing. You know, it's a lot about Black women being the backbone of the Democratic Party, it, certain Black women. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Let me be good. I'm trying to be good. I've been bad lately. Um, well-behaved women are written, seldom, <laughs> right? Seldom written about in history. So I've not been a well-behaved woman. Black women are the backbone of the Democratic Party. We hear that all the time. All of these whispering the sweet nothings in our ear. Doc, you brought up a stat along our campaign journey that still rocks my soul every time I think about the conversation that I have with you. And I'm using this as an example because this this part we we need one of the two parties to actually give a damn give a shit maybe I should have used it too much um, we need one of the two parties to care about the people you know some some people are more concerned about the language that I use than the fact that people are no nah. you know they they more concerned about being prim and proper instead of focusing on evictions, focusing in on, we got a madman in the White House that is a clear and present danger and that the Democrats have got to come out and not equivocate for standing up for the people. The people need somebody, people losing their houses, their livelihoods, they stress the hell out. Our essential workers are scared. Every single day they step into the line of fire for us, whether it's the grocery store or going to the, to the, to the, to the drug store, going out to get gas, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, it just drives me crazy. So don't worry about how, whether or not I'm being prim and proper when people are Hello, dying. Somebody. I want the police language and don't say that and how dare you. We care more about the poor and the working poor and the barely middle class in this country and what the facts are in this critical moment, but that, I digress. So black women are the backbone of the Democratic Party. So you would think if that was really, really the case that they would look at some health disparities, Doc. Can you talk about the broken heart example that you have, that, oh my God, rock my world. So go on and share with folks. Just use this as an example. 50% of black women, 50% of black women over the age of 19, 50, you and me, S and T, were two black women. 50% of Black women over the age 18 have some form of heart disease. Black women are more likely to die from heart disease. We think of heart disease being only a heart attack and associating that with a male. Black women are more likely to die from some form of heart disease than Black men, white men, white women, anybody. It's our Black women. And why do you think we suffer from broken hearts? more commonly than anyone else in this nation. Why? It's because of how they treat us and what they do to us and how they treat the black men that we love, our sons, our spouses, our fathers. So not only do we have to worry about ourselves being black women in America, our skin tone, our hair, not only do we have to worry about us, we have to worry about our sons, our daughters, our fathers, our uncles and grandfathers, the ones that they lock up, disproportionately. I heard in New York, they're giving uh, most of the tickets for, for carrying alcohol outdoor. The majority of them are going to black and Latino people. White people, what is white privilege? How can, okay, I'm poor. I mean, I'm white. How can you say I have white privilege? You can go outside with an alcohol or beverage and not get stopped by the police and get a ticket for it. When you are black and brown, they want to follow the law. But when you're white, these, these simple things that you can do that black people cannot do. So black women suffer from more broken hearts because we are the most underappreciated and abused population in this country. And not only do we suffer abuse from people who don't look like us, but we also suffer abuse from people who do have our same skin colors, but they believe they've made it, okay? They believe they've made it. So they're gonna vote against 
the very people that look like them. They're going to vote against Medicare for all because now they've made it and they need to continue to get their uh, funding from big pharma and pharmaceutical industries. What happened to uh, South Carolina? Yes. South Carolina with the, with the primary. How much pharmaceutical money did the person in South Carolina who came out in support of Biden take? Look it up. I don't remember the number, but it was a lot. So, so black women suffer from broken hearts more than any other person in this country. And if you give a damn about black women, the very least, the very least you could do is to say, you know what, sister, no matter what happens to you in this country, in this wealthiest country in the world, no matter what happens to you, we are going to make sure that you at a minimum are able to see any doctor, go to any hospital you want to, and not have to worry about any cost. That's the least we can do. The least they can do. And you know what? The platform ain't even binding. I mean, it's a non-binding document. Lord, help me, Jesus. Help, Philip, Dr. Philip Agnew. Let me bring in Brother Act, Dr. Dillon. Yeah. PDA, we're going to have to do this again. I, I mean, Zoom is on fire, baby. It's on fire. <laughs> Woo, Dr. Philip Agnew, one of the co-founders of the Dream Defenders. Many of you may know that when those young people got out there after the murder of Trey John, Trayvon Martin, and they basically said, hell no, we're not going anywhere. We're not going to take it. Justice is going to happen. They got out there and they fought for that justice, even standing in, sitting in, being mm -hmm. in the offices of them folks, letting them know you ain't going to get no peace mm -hmm. until... Oh, we got to call the question on this. What does justice look like? He was a national surrogate for Bernie Sanders 2020 campaign. He too traveled all over this country, changing his schedule, just like the doc did. <laughs> up for the downtrodden, the Milan. Come on, somebody. Hello, somebody. That is what Dr. Philip Agnew does. And he just co-founded another organization, baby, called Black Men. Build. Hello, <laughs> black men. Build it, baby. They build it all over this country. I bring you the one and only, Dr. Philip Agnew. Agnew! Listen, Senator, Senator, Dr. Senator, Reverend Dr. Senator Nina Turner. Listen, I'm honored to be on here this evening. It was an honor of mine to go around this country and follow Dr. Dooley and follow Dr. Senator Nina Turner. And I'm proud to have received my honorary doctorate from With These Hands University. Uh, I'm proud, I'm proud to have matriculated. Don't do that in the chat. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm proud, I'm proud to have been a part of this movement. And, and what we know, Senator, is that this movement isn't over. When I look on and now six pages here, if you could scroll over on the Zoom, um, and see all these sisters and brothers and folks and siblings on this call, it reminds me of a quote by Mark Twain when he said, rumors of our death remain greatly exaggerated. Come on now. The rumors mm -hmm. of our death remain greatly exaggerated because yes. we know, and we've been all over this country. I was following up under you, but we put on some miles around this country, and we know that this movement did not end April the 8th, that it didn't mm -hmm. begin in Brooklyn that we have work to do and that the work to get Medicare for all, not some, justice for all, not some, housing for all, not some, you, uh, Green New Deal for all, not some, is not over, that it continues. And that's why I'm proud to be on here because there's a lot of other people that when their coach or when their player, their star player gets kicked out of the tournament, they take their ball and go on home. But yeah. that's not the movement that we're a part of. We understand that there, this thing has not ended and it has not stopped. You know, right now, for the past few months, we've seen people take the streets um, in the name of one George Floyd, who yeah. for eight minutes and 46 seconds had the life snuffed out of him by a Minneapolis police officer. And mm. it is my contention that if you care about what happened for those eight minutes and 46 seconds, that you must care about black people, about poor people, about women, while they are still in the land of the living, that they deserve yes. to have their names remembered and have their lives be of value before the last eight minutes and 46 seconds of their life. And if we are gonna be a country worthy of being called a civilization, worthy of being called a humane nation, that we have a duty to take care of the least of these. 
yes. those that cannot speak up, those that cannot be there. And if we are going to make this party the party that it can be, that the work is not done. And that's why I'm glad to be on this call, because we need Medicare for all. Right. We need justice yes. for all. We need housing yes. for all. We need a green Amen. New deal for all people. And we cannot stop this work. And so I'm happy to be here because, like I said, we, we, we didn't take the day off. We can't take the day off because our opposition every single day, they're working and plotting and strategizing. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing about calls that the Biden team is making and saying we're not going to vote on this. And they're moving in unison. They're moving Come. organized. They're Come moving on. in concert with one another. And so we've got to make sure that we do everything that we can to make sure that the knee and the foot of this country does not remain on the necks of our families, right? And so the work is not done. And so I'm, I'm overjoyed and ecstatic to be here with each and every one of you all. I feel the righteous indignation and the anger. I felt the depression. I felt like this runaway train that hit a, hit a brick wall um, for a few weeks, but it's moments like this. It's conversations with Senator Turner. It's conversations listening to Dr. Dooley that encourage me and give me the fuel. And I think give all of us the fuel that we need to keep this thing going. To close, I wanna, I wanna. We know the convention is upon us, and I wanna close with a quote. Uh, one of my favorite ever convention quotes in history. Let's see if I can find it here. I got too many tabs open. What did I do here? There we go. This is a quote, um, and uh, many of you all may know it. Uh, it is uh, from Kennedy's speech that he gave, um, uh, Ted Kennedy, his concession speech. And I want to leave this with you all and give it right back to you, Senator Turner. And yes. someday, long after this convention, long after the signs come down and the crowd stop cheering and the band stop playing, may it be said of our campaign that we kept the faith. May it be said of us that we found our faith again. And may it be said of us both in dark passages and in bright days, in the words of Tennyson, that we have a, that have a special meaning for us now. I am part of all that I have met. So though much is taken, much abides. That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. For all those whose cares have been our concern, the work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. We're going to get this because we're going to win it and we're going to work for it. Woo-wee! And let the, 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 the University of With These Hands say amen, baby. <laughs> Alan, you know what? I'm just going to, um, Dr. Agnew, one question for you, and I'm going to give it over to Alan because we have a special video from a sister that we need to get out there and help win her race, but I don't want to steal Alan's thunder. Mm -hmm. Why should people from all walks of life and all generations, I mean, you, and I, I mean, we keep, we always keep dividing each other. I'm tired mm -hmm. of doing it. I'm trying to talk myself out of doing it. You know, we, I'm, we being brainwashed, you know, who's a Democrat, who's a, Democrat, who's a Gen X, or who's a boomer. Mm -hmm. No, we, we part of humanity. You know, I'm just tired of yes. it. But can you, from, from your experience as an activist, I mean, somebody that has been right there in the muck, the mire, in the trenches, to what you were able to do on this campaign. Can you talk about why you actually give a shit about Medicare for all? I can't draw, the word shit is just a uh, follow. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, when we're surrounded by shit, you gotta call it out. So right. um, for, for me, I have, I have family. Um, I have family that deserve to have health, that have worked in, in the, for the reason for me, it's basic, right? It's a personal thing. My mother and my father deserve to be able to go and get the care that they need and that they require. Everyone in my family deserves it, absolutely. I deserve, I'm 35 and I got high blood pressure. I got a whole bunch of things going on with me and I deserve. But on a big level for me, what it is, Senator Turner, is that I believe, and I believe the facts will bear out, that black people, poor people, Latino people, women, indigenous people are the foundation of all of the wealth of the Western world. That it is our labor, it is our blood, our sweat, our tears, our birth 
It is our birthright to have these basic things. And so when I say I want Medicare for all, I'm saying I want everything that I deserve, everything that was already promised to me by virtue of being born. I don't care how old you are, you deserve to have care, you deserve to have health. And so I, I break down all of the walls and say I'm too young to care about Medicare for all because what we are talking about is the wealthiest country in the history of all mankind in perpetuity and that we deserve we have earned, in fact, we have paid for in full yes. the, 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 the power and the ability to go and get the care that we need, especially living in a society that seems hell bent on making every one of us sick as hell. Woo-wee, there it is. Brother Allen, there, there, there it is. Okay, Woo. without equivocation, stop commodifying healthcare. We can't afford it. Them, the military budget, military industrial complex, the discretionary budget of 2019 was about $1.19 trillion, 61% of that, or $720 billion, give or take a few billion. Went to the Pentagon, sisters and brothers. So don't let mm. this what we cannot afford. We had the House of Representatives. I'm old enough to remember because it just happened. Mm. The House of Representatives that's controlled by the we know what we got with these daggone Republicans. We got to fight them tooth and nail. But we can fight Republicans and fight wrong and call out right and wrong on both sides here. Come on, now the people need somebody. In the House of Representatives that is controlled by Democrats, put up a cut the Pentagon budget by 10% and it failed, sisters and brothers. It failed. We got to call this stuff out and we got to send more for this to the Congress, more progressives to the legislature, more progressives on the city councils, more progressives in mayor's offices, more progressives in governor's offices, and don't let anybody forget how they got there and why they're there when they get there. Hello, somebody on that. This ain't too much to ask. Philip Agnew, Dr. Agnew laid it out, baby. This is, and plus is our tax dollars. Yeah, mm -hmm. our money. Telling us, they acting like it's their money, Dr. Dooley. Mm. It's, our, it's our money. So if we want to have a social contract one to another that says that Medicare for all is what we want as citizens, we the people that y'all see behind me of the United States of America want Medicare for all, why can't we have that? Quote, the great urban poet Tupac got money for wars but can't feed the poor. Come on, somebody. Brother, mm. go take the mic. Sister on fire tonight. Go <laughs> take it. Take it. I'm done. You, you did that thing. <laughs> um, well, okay, so thank you so much, Nina and uh, Phil Agnew and Dr. Dooley. And I'm about to introduce uh, a very short video from Representative Rashida Tlaib and Mike Fox, if you can get that ready. Let me just say this, though. I do think um, the Bernie Sanders campaigns, um, they really helped inspire um, a transformation in the political discourse in the country. The the, the sort of perspective of a social justice left sort of emerged back into and just exploded onto the scene of electoral politics where it had been vanquished for what seemed like ages, pretty much going back to almost the 1980 election and Ted Kennedy there from Philip Agnew. But now what we have is with Bernie not winning the nomination and in part thanks to the people who collected inside that campaign and were inspired by that campaign, the passing of the torch to a new generation of visionary progressive leaders. And I think we can include Nina Turner, we can include Dr. Victoria Dooley and Phil Agnew in that generation. And we also have the person I'm about to introduce the very short video for. And uh, Rashida Tlaib, for those of you who don't know, is uh, in a very close re-election campaign, one that was always slated to be close. She barely won election in 2018. There's a long backstory to that we won't go into. And the same person, a much more moderate and much more conservative Democrat is challenging her again uh, in her race. And so she is on the campaign trail tonight and unfortunately could not join us in person. But Mike Fox, are you ready to cue the video? Because we're going to throw to it right now. Rashida wanted to send a message to us and just very quickly state the importance of Medicare for All for herself and for her district, the third poorest district in the United States, Michigan 13. And you're, are you ready, Mike Fox, to set that up? I believe so. Here, Grand. 
Let's uh, get this. Let's get this full screen. So it's absolutely beautiful. And Hi, everyone. It's Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Thank you so much to the incredible work of Progressive Democrats of America for championing an issue that is so dear to my district. We have the third poorest congressional district in the country, and that's why movement work and organizing around Medicare for all is so critical. We're done getting sick. We're done dying because of corporate greed. And so I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your continued work and know that you have a part and a champion on your side. I move with a sense of urgency. I'm the eldest of 14. I've been taking care of people all my life. And I can tell you, I know what it looks like and feels like when people do nothing. And it's about time we demand something better than what we have now. And Medicare for all is it. That's our message from Rashida. A very brief message sent to us tonight about the necessity of pushing for Medicare for all. And I just want to quickly um, say this to everybody on the call. Go to RashidaForCongress.com or .org. I think it's .com. Do what you can in these next six days. Uh, do what you can for Cori Bush in Missouri First, too. Do what you can for Eva out in Arizona One. Um, do what you can for Ilhan Omar a week later uh, up in Minnesota. Um, do what you can to knock out Richie Neal, who just is a roadblock to anything progressive the head of the Ways and Means Committee and have Alex Morse to feed him. But Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar clearly are uh, on, on the, in the short and so powerful group of young visionary progressives who now are center stage in American politics. They're facing challenges in their district. Rashida's comes to an end on August 4th and Ilhan's on August 11th. Do whatever you can to support them However you can, sign up to phone bank with PDA as an independent expenditure pack. We are pouring phone calls into Rashida's district and sign up with Mike Fox, Mike Fox at pdamerica.org. Um, also, just go straight to the campaign. Do whatever you can. Uh, support by donating, but support Rashida Tlaib. This election is coming up on Tuesday. We know that if she loses, the moderates in the Democratic Party and the reactionaries in the country and around the world with Rashida, they will herald that as a massive defeat. Well, we're not gonna let it happen. It's not gonna happen. And I've gotten to know Representative Tlaib and she is just such an unbelievable, um, just public representative for her district, spokesperson on the breadth of issues that face our society and for the people of the world and she is a beacon for our time. So please support Rashida however you can. And we're gonna hear now next from Judith Whitmer. And for that, I'm gonna throw back to you, Senator Turner. Oh, brother Alan, you could have kept it going. <laughs> nah, so, okay. oh, sister, she, the, the badass herself, she definitely invited to the island of misfit black girls. <laughs> Ooh, the chairwoman, and um, she started. What, what's that chairwoman? A lean left, the be left all times. What was the name of that organization? Left caucus. Left caucus. I knew it was left something. But let me tell you, Firebrand in the great state of Nevada has been championing and standing up for a very long time within the circles of the Democratic Party, and did not hesitate. Her and some other cold-blooded folks in the great state of Nevada. Now, y'all remember what Nevada did for Bernie Sanders 2020 campaign, baby. They did that. People from all walks of life. Nevada came through for this campaign. It gave, it, ooh, the wind beneath our wings at a time when we needed it. But this was so much bigger than the campaign. And what this chairwoman has done, they, Nevada, the great state has not, they, she didn't rest on the laurels of what the progressives were able to, to do in that great state. She took that energy and that synergy to the next level. And it is because of the progressives, the Bernie Kratz and some other Kratz, because we got some other Kratz, we probably got some Warren Kratz on here, some Biden Kratz, all, all, all are welcome, contrary to what folks may say on the other side. On our side, you're welcome, but we just want folks that's willing to fight for what is just, for what is right, and for what is good. But the chairwoman did not rest on that victory in Nevada. They kept organizing. They got to work, baby. They started taking over some stuff. And so they have won the majority of seats on the counts on the county level and also on the state level so progressives can get something done. And then that wasn't enough for the chairwoman. That just was not enough for her. So her and her squad decided 
and they was going to posse up a whole bunch of other folks and say, you know what? Yes, Medicare for all, we need it, we deserve it, and we, we draw on the line in the sand, babe. This is where we stand. Whose side are you on? And then we're going to invite Bernie Kratz and other progressives who want to sign on delegates, Bernie delegates, to, to, to take a stand against the neoliberals in the Democratic Party. It is Medicare for all of us. I bring you the chairwoman from the great state of Nevada. Chairwoman Jude, go and do your thing, chair lady. Go Thanks. Thing. Thank you, Nina. As Nina said, Nevada delivered for Bernie Sanders by a major landslide. And in fact, Senator Turner was with us on victory night. We had, had a really great celebration. Um, so uh, I just want to acknowledge all of the work that Senator Turner put in and how much um, she means to Nevada. Uh, but guess what we mobilized and organized around in Nevada to get that win? It was a singular issue that was primary and critical to the voters in Nevada, and that was Medicare for all. Um, it is a winning message. It's absolutely a winning message. So. After the caucuses here in Nevada, we stayed organized and kept all the Bernie delegates actively engaged through the convention process. And as Senator Turner just told you, by doing that, we were able to adopt the most progressive platforms in Nevada history at the county and state levels. We were able to put together a slate of progressives and run them at the, sta at the state convention. And we won nine out of 10 seats on our executive board. We now effectively have control of the Nevada Democratic Party. And this is, a, this is what needs to happen at every county and state level across the country. And we can do it. Um, it's not up to Nina Turner. It's not up to Dr. Dooley. It's not up to Philip Agnew or Rashida Tlaib. It's up to us. As Bernie has been saying for a long time, change happens from the bottom up. And here in Nevada, we consider ourselves the leaders in the fight for healthcare justice. And that's what we expect everyone to be. It's time for us to step up. Nina and everyone is extremely inspirational. Their words are, are incredibly inspiring and motivational, but the work comes from us. They can't do it by themselves. Senator Sanders was not going to do it by himself. They need all of us to show up. We need to be there. We need to be there and we need to take leadership. We need to own it. And that's what we're doing at the national convention. Our Bernie delegates in Nevada were pretty dejected by what they were seeing at the national convention. Um, not only have we been sidelined by the pandemic, uh, we're being restricted in our participation. Um, we realize that it's necessary that we can't be there in person but we still feel that our rights are being stripped. We're not able to participate fully in what should be a democratic process. Um, we saw that with the platform, even with the Unity Task Commission report, you know, we were supposed to be excited about a mention of Medicare for all. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not excited by that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't give a single payer health care. And, and it's absolutely, incredible to me that the Democrats aren't talking about the need for single-payer health care. We're living through a public health crisis where it's, it's obvious and irrefutable that our private insurance system has failed us, absolutely failed us. And yet we're talking about how things are going to go back to normal when we get through this. Well, I don't want them to go back to normal. I don't want the status quo. I think it's time for us to make our voices heard. And that's why we organized around this petition to pledge to vote no on the national democratic platform because it does not include a, an option or a plank in support of single payer health care for all Americans, for all people in this country. Uh, there, there is no excuse for a country that can obliterate the entire world seven times over, but we can't provide health care for our people. What kind of country is that? Is this the kind of society that we want to live in? We need to be working for a world in which we can live with equality and justice for all. But that's up to us. We have to show up. 
We need to sign this pledge to vote no on the national platform. And we need to vote no as a block. On August 11th, we're going to all vote together on the same day and to register our protest as a block and make sure that the Democratic Party, our party leaders and elected officials know that we will not stop fighting for single payer health care. So join me in, in signing that petition to pledge to vote no and vote with us on August 11th. There it is, plain and simple. Thank you. Somebody got the stand, the chairwoman made the stand. And I, I'm going to uh, the guy who is known as the chief of receipts on the Bernie Sanders 2020 on our campaign. His name is Warren Gunnels. Please, if you're on social media, follow this brother. If you want the data, if you want the facts, you want the numbers, Warren Gunnels can get them for you. And so he's going back to Elon Musk of all people, Madam Chair, going to talk about the left is losing the middle. So this is what the chief of receipts had to say. Because I want us to know we are in the mainstream. I mean, if it's important for folks to be labeled as Dr. Dooley laid out, what's radical, radically wrong? Because radical just really means getting at the root. You know, I don't like I don't like being let folks steal that word. It means getting to the root, the root of the matter. So if they want to call us radical, then we'll have at it. But since they want to use it to the negative. Dr. Dooley is absolutely right. What's radical is not providing Medicare for all. But I want you to know, if we want to use labels, we are in the mainstream. The mother folks are not within the mainstream. Let's go, Chief of Receipts, Warren Gunners. 72% want to expand Social Security. This, this is what folks in America want. 69% want Medicare for all. Hello, somebody. And it's even higher when you break out Democrats out of that number. 67% want a $15 a, a, an hour minimum wage. 67% want to make marijuana legal. We couldn't even get that in the platform. Hello, somebody. We know what the war on drugs did to the black community and poor communities and brown communities. Ooh, y'all, sister hot tonight. 64% want to tax your extreme wealth. That's Warren Gunnell saying that to, to Elon Musk. 64% support unions. 63% want a Green New Deal, 58% want to cancel student debt. That's where the American people are, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies. That's where the American people are. But yet we oh, can't- but, but Nina, we can't afford that. Well, but we can afford- We gotta give a few, we gotta give, give a few more trillions to the, the 1%. Just a few more. And then this madman that's in the office right now, because that's what you really think that Democrats, we need to seize this opportunity. Clear and present danger is President Donald J. Trump. This man put a, a $1.8 billion provision in the COVID for, 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 for the FBI building. I mean, come on. This is the moment, this is the opportunity. This is it. Brother Alan Gong, I know we're supposed to make this a little bit participatory. I, I'm telling you, <laughs> Dear woman, uh, Judith, Dr. Victoria Dooley, Dr. Honorary Dr. Brother Philip Agnew and everybody in between, y'all did that tonight. I'm feeling, I, look, I feel like I'm feeling all right right now. I'm feeling like I can go on. There's a song in the African-American spiritual tradition that says, I feel like carrying on. Doing stuff like this with you guys, being here in this moment, I feel like carrying on. I ain't gonna sing it because y'all ain't gonna love me as much because I can't sing. All black folks can't sing. Brother Allen, go and take it. Well, if people in uh, if, if with everybody on the call wants to raise their hands, and then maybe Mike Hirsch from PDA, if you can let us know who is doing that uh, in the chat, and then we can call on them. And while that's happening, just maybe um, you know thoughts from Dr. Dooley or, or Philip Agnew while we wait for hands to be raised. And um, I mean, speak. go ahead, Dr. Dooley. I have a quote from Angela Davis, and I was just thinking about it. Um, Jails and prisons are designed to break human beings, mm -hmm. to convert the population into specimens in a zoo, obedient to our keepers, but dangerous to each other. And I know, know how this can apply to prison and we need to, to legalize marijuana and to free the slaves in prison. But when you think about society as a whole now, we are in the middle of a pandemic. They are refusing to give us relief from rent and mortgages. We are in the middle of a pandemic. They are refusing to give us health care. So the way we live, we're set up in this prison, even working class people that think they made it. 
they're underpaying us. There's no place in this country where you can afford a two bedroom apartment on minimum wage. They're underpaying us, we're working hard. And then they wanna make us believe that if we just work hard, save up, not use any vacation days, maybe five or six years, save up a little bit of money and make it to Florida so we can go to Disney World. We've been achieved the American dream. That is not the American dream. They are keeping us in a prison by refusing to give us basic rights. The basic right to not die from an illness that is too expensive for you to treat. They are refusing to give us basic rights. We are living in prison. We need to wake up and get out. And uh, active, somebody said, I forget who it was, activism is our rent for living here on this planet. So I know all the people in this on this call are gonna be activists, but that is our rent for living on this planet. And we need to encourage our brothers and sisters to do the same, to run for something and to keep fighting the good fight. Cause that is our rent for utilizing, our, buying our time here on this planet. Amen. Um, so we have a bunch of people who've raised their hands. I, I saw that some people were confused about how to do that. And I apologize about that, but obviously some people figured it out. So Danette, you're up. And just if everybody can keep their questions brief and uh, you're up, Danette, go for it. I believe I trying to unmute you. There you go, Danette. Uh, I, can, I, think. I just want to I just want to say I love you, Nina. Oh my God, you're so fierce. And Victoria, I love you. Dr. Dooley, Judith. Oh my God. Just you know, we all have to stick together. I know this is really hard right now, but if we stick together, if you look throughout history, if we have a big enough coalition and people that keep pushing, look at the French Revolution. They didn't think they would topple their government and guess what happened? So we got to keep at it. Don't give up. I mean, I know it's hard right now. Just keep, keep getting up, keep showing up, keep doing it and do whatever you can because every little bit helps. Thank you. Thank you Thank so much. You. Brother Allen, um, before we go to the next person, is, is uh, Agnew still on? Oh, it's hard for me to tell because there's so many people. It's so small to scroll oh. around. Let me see. Uh, he, he I'm Agnew. not sure that he is. He might not be. The Agnew left. Okay, go right ahead. Okay, next up was uh, Sigmund Marx. That sounds like uh, quite a name there between. You could be um, Carl Freud, too. Go ahead, Sigmund Marx. <laughs> Yeah, that's my other name. It's actually Eric Pierce. Um, uh, hey, everybody. I just want to say this is like oxygen. This is like medicine. Big love to everybody, to Nina, Dr. Dooley. Love you all. Quick question. Um, what is the strategy for reaching out to the Warren delegates, the um, Biden delegates, and all the others? Thank you. On the petition you're talking about, correct? Yeah, I imagine. Okay, so we, we actively are. So what we're doing is we're identifying someone in each state delegation to carry that petition to every delegate in their delegation, including Warren, Biden delegates, all their delegates. Um, we've already gotten Biden signatures and we, in fact, there was a Bloomberg delegate that signed. So we're, um, we are trying to get all delegates to sign, not just Bernie delegates. Um, thank you. And um, there, of course, are not many delegates other than Bernie and, and um, Biden delegates. It's so overwhelmingly between those two groups, obviously. But there are some, as uh, Judith pointed out, uh, other candidates who have delegates. And I think, right, they have yeah. somebody. We but have somebody. But the we got a Bloomberg we're delegate. Oh, go ahead. We're, we're trying to show the party, though, that there's widespread support. So we actually don't want it to just be Bernie delegates. Um, we've already done internal surveys that show that the majority of the national delegates, all delegates, in, uh, support single payer health care. So we're trying to get them all on board for signing this uh, petition and pledging to vote no on the platform. Yeah, and I think I, if I can chime in here, because you know we were on the, a strategy call yesterday, and you know. Even if they, people maybe, you know, if we can just get that petition number way up and get all those numbers up, <laughs> they're going to really feel that. If we can just get that up, even before the actual vote happens, uh, that will be so powerful. So getting, getting people to sign this petition in and of itself will be very powerful. Up next is Cole Silva. Cole, you are unmuted. Or I tried. There you go. Cole, you're unmuted. Hi. Uh, I just want to thank everyone. <laughs> I had a question on if you had any thoughts or advice or experience with those who are trying to organize for single payer universal health care in their own states instead of taking a federal approach. Thank you. 
Um, I mean, I can tell you that um, PDA partners with an organization called One Payer States, um, and uh, Chuck Panacchio is out of the Philadelphia area, is one of their lead organizers. So check out One Payer States. And I do know that there's going to be a lot of initiative now in California again to push uh, Governor Newsom on that. Um, up next is, uh, uh, does anybody else want to chime in, Dr. Dooley? Or yeah, but I, actually, mm -hmm. I actually would like to chime in on that. We, we are pushing for that in Nevada. We've started to work on that. Um, we're trying to get legislators to sponsor that, that bill, that legislation. And if you've ever had the pleasure to chat with Michael Lighty, um, he very Lighty. much very much advocates for uh, a, a state approach. And I think that too often we get so focused on what's going on in the national scene and we get frustrated by what's going on in the parties and, and the White House and everything else that we forget that there's a lot of things we can do on the local and state levels to affect change. Amen to that. Um, Dr. Dooley, did you want to say anything on that? Um, no, no, just, uh, yes, Michael Lighty, to, to connect with him. He's he's the expert in those sorts of things. Um, is it Michael's a PDA board member? We, we love Michael Lighty. So on to Elsa Schaefer, I believe. Did I get that name right? Um, there's so many guests, it's a little hard to... Uh... Oh, go ahead, Elsa, can you talk? Hmm, are you trying to unmute while I'm unmuting you too, Elsa? doesn't seem to be working. We'll, we'll come back to you. I'll go to Jamie Kinney. Hmm. Hi, Jamie, you're up. Okay, yeah, this was actually a similar to Cole Silva's question. I'm wondering if, to, I wanna get a sense of the group about whether or not they think it's the best use of our time and energy as progressives to work on a state level initiative petition to do Medicare for all on the state level. Yeah, that was, that was a great question. When once somebody asked the question and we, we get that the question's there, we're gonna move on. So we have more, pe more time for more people to ask more questions. Oh, okay, sorry about that, Jamie. But um, if anybody wants to respond to Jamie's um, question, um, I'm going to, yeah, go ahead. I'm try, oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Nina. No, no, go ahead. You're fine. Um, I was going to try Elsa again. Um, so people should not be unmuting and Mike Hirsch, I'll unmute them. Okay. So here we go. Elsa. No. Okay. Elsa didn't seem to work. So Giselle, I'm going to try next. This is Elsa. I'll go Elsa. Oh, you hear me? Thank you. Thank you so much for continuing to do all this. Um, so I think 1384 is a brilliant house, house bill. And I just wonder why, and if you know when, it's going to be estimated by the Congressional Budget Office. Because I think until we can put some numbers to it, the other side is always going to say, oh, it's too expensive. Oh, it's too this or that. We need to be able to show that it is less expensive, that it covers more, uh, and we need to have their meet so that they can stop just using talking points and we can say, as the CBO said, X, Y, Z. Does anyone know? Are we waiting for the next administration? Man, I, I don't really think they care about the C. They're using that as an excuse. We already know that is less expensive. There have been many studies already that show overall that Medicare for all not only will save lives, but will cost the taxpayers less money. That, that's just a proven irrefutable fact here, that type of investment. So I understand what you're saying, Elsa. But I don't think that it is necessarily the numbers that's going to move these people who really mm -hmm. don't want it. I mean, we got people on the Democratic side who understand this, and they still don't want it. Saving money? I mean, trillions of dollars will be saved. And, and the, the fact of the matter is, especially with this pandemic going on, to be so heartless as a nation, how, how can we put a price on, on people's lives in, in that way? But we're, we're doing that every single day, but not hesitating to give, as Dr. Dooley mentioned, the, the, the less than 1%. Zero in taxes, federal taxes, Bezos, Amazon, zero, zero in federal taxes, more tax breaks, starving government so that then, we, then they can stand up and say, we don't have the resources to afford it. I mean, as soon as COVID hit, 
they put together a package. They started print, printing money, technically, to bail out corporation. Yet every time it comes to funding Medicare for all, we got some excuse. Excuse is over, we got enough money. So was, I, I just don't believe that the people who are standing against this care about the cost. They care about what their mega donors have to say about it. We should not commodify healthcare in the United States of America. Um, can, I, can I toss to you, Dr. Dooley, and, and just your thoughts on why the establishment does hold the line in, in something that is so, you know, clearly their arguments really don't hold water. So do you just see it as just abject greed and stock? Absolutely, uh, that's all it is. Yeah. It, it's yeah. just greed. Um, like, it, like I said, Eddie Tyler um, would be able to solve this problem of underinsurance and uninsurance. And it's just, hey, just let's just give it to everybody. And as far as studies, I believe uh, we had the one funded by the Koch brothers. What was it, the Mercatus study or something like that? Right. Right. So we have a ton of evidence <laughs> to prove. Or just look at it, just look at Canada, just look at their numbers. So we have a ton of evidence to prove that Medicare for all not only saves lives, but it saves money. So it does boil down to greed. We are dealing with the top 0.1% of donors who are writing the agenda. Um, the current person, the orange person that we have in the White House, he is only looking out to benefit from him and his wealthy friends. So it all boils down to money and greed. We need election um, finance reform. Um, we need to get the big money out of politics so that we can elect more people who are going to actually vote for the people. There's nobody who could say that I'm running for Congress or whatever. And I, I'm running. And part of my platform, there's going to be a little bit of you with, without having insurance, but the majority of you will. That just doesn't make any sense. There's tons of evidence to already support the benefits of a single payer Medicare for all system. And not only that, to support that it is superior to the public option plan. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, Giselle Di Campagna, you are already unmuted. Oh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having uh, this call. I tell you, after the platform vote, I really, really needed this. <laughs> so you've re-energized me. I wanted to, I'm from San Juan, Puerto Rico, and um, I work every day through my profession helping um, immigrants, asylum seekers, and refugees um, get the tools they need when they arrive here, uh, if <laughs> they're able to arrive here. And I wanted to throw in a consideration for the group is uh, let's not forget the black and brown uh, brothers and sisters that are not only unable to seek asylum now in US and actually turned around and sent to sometimes a country they don't even know, uh, but also the healthcare for all, it, it applies to them as well. It applies to the conditions that a lot of them are in, in detention centers, in horrid uh, conditions, um, in conditions that I we would not put our, our pets in. And um, I just wanted to throw that in that as we um, use our voices, that we speak for those that I believe have a place, a, 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 an integral place in our society and, and that we include them in those conversations with regards to healthcare and, and especially right now with COVID-19 just ravaging through these detention centers and on, on the borders. Um, and that that is part of what I just wanted to bring up um, because that's really close to my heart. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, we'll, uh, we'll move on to Robert ACA38CD. So I think that's California 38CD. Robert, you're up. Yes, Roberto. sir. How are you? Can you hear me? Yep. Go for it. Hi, everybody. I really feel very good about this meeting because uh, we have been lost. Uh, out of words about the actions of the delegates of the DNC, I think that we had to opt up the rhetoric about who they are. In my eyes, there are criminals. There is people that is enable corporations to get profiting out of the pain and suffering of the people. And just like at any other politicians that they give you lip service and say that they're gonna do something for you. And when they get into office, they do the opposite and they start working for the money of corporations, they are criminals. And we had to call them what they are because their actions are enabling people that don't have the lack to have healthcare coverage or their healthcare coverage is not enough for them to die every year in this nation. And that's criminal. 
that is a life and death situation that we living in the country with the most wealthy country in the history of the world. And we had to call them what they are and they are criminals. And we had to, I don't know, put a poster everywhere and show them that they voted against medical for all and start shaming for what they are. They are not representing the people. They are not representing the constituencies. People in America wants Medicare for all. And with this pandemic, if they still people thinking that that's not what we need to do, they are out of their minds and they are criminals. Thank okay. you much. Thank you so much. Any thoughts, uh, Nina, Dr. Dilley? Yeah, he laid it out there. Yeah, no. <laughs> not thinking about the people. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think so Angela Davis, Davis also said uh, more politicians need to be unemployed. And yeah, there are more politicians who we need to vote out and say, you're not meeting our needs. So we're going to vote for somebody who is meeting our needs. Um, up next. Oh, I thought you were um, unmuted, Hannah. Um, hold on here. Uh, you were typing. So I think you're up now again, Hannah Joe Barnes, CD45. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, this question is actually for Nina and uh, Victoria. When we talk about racial disparities um, in our healthcare system, we often talk at black and brown people and not often get them engaged in the conversation um, and allow them to understand the importance of it in their lives, right? And you know, not only have I attended enough meetings to know that there is lack of representation in terms of people of color, but also in terms of policy writing and uh, policy making. Um, what should our messaging be or what do we need to tell our allies in terms of their outreach messaging to start reaching to those communities, underserved communities, when it comes to this information that's viable for them to understand, right? And perhaps getting them engaged. I'm just curious um, to know what your recommendations would be in terms of that. Um, Doc, for the sake of time, just one of us can answer. I'm, I'm gonna let you go ahead and take that. Okay, so as far as outreach to community co of color specifically, um, part of the obstacle is, um, a lot of people of color, especially black and brown women, are frontline workers. Uh, they're working two jobs, so just, they just don't have the time. Um, so that's why I feel like it's important to actually get out and door knock um, when you and to get progressive running who to support these policies and to go in and knock for doors, uh, like I did in several states across the country, and just meet people where they are because they're probably not going to have time to jump on Zoom meetings. And like I said, they're working two jobs, they're taking care of the kids, they're being a mother and wife. So just to meet them where they are or to go to other places where you think um, uh, community centers or wherever to go to the people instead of expecting them to come to us. And a lot of pushback I've got, I've received for, about Medicare for all, specifically from people of color sometimes who were part of, well, I'm not gonna say it, but part of the hive, um, supporters of a, that way called the hive, but anyway. Well, Medicare for all is not going to cure racism. And so, but to me, that's such a twisted mentality that, that my retort is, you know what, free and the slaves didn't cure racism either. Our goal here is not to cure racism. That is not gonna happen. But at least because we know that racism and toxic stress bears weight on our body and turns and manifests into physical illness and manifests into health disparities, the very least we can do is that guarantee that when you experience that racism that turns into health problems, that you can at least get to a doctor that you need to go to and be able to leave without paying anything. So I hope that's helps. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Julian. Um, we have like 15 people on stack, so we're gonna have to close off stack, obviously. Now, what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna just see Anne Duglos is up next, then Mark Zamoski, and then Sharon Abreu, and you're gonna go one, two, three, and keep all your comments and questions, try to keep it all under 45 seconds, because we had a lot of people. So it's Anne is up first, then Mark, then Sharon. Hi, um, thank you for recognizing me. And um, Nina, it's, it, it's super exciting. I'm yeah, fangirling right now and vicariously for at least one of my friends. Um, but anyways, I, uh, so what do we need to do? So we have, we have the convention, um, sign the petition, work on getting the Biden delegates in our, in our states. Um, I'm part of Democrats Abroad. To, to support us. 
Um, then after the convention, then what next? And helping the candidates who are running, like Rashida and Ilan and uh, Cory Bush. Um, I'm just asking what what steps and like because uh, I know the time is short and it's running out. Okay, and let's go to Mark and then Sharon. We won't forget the question again, so thank you. And um, Mark, you're up. Okay, thanks, Alan. Uh, I've been a PDA member now, dropping letters for uh, for about a year and a half. And uh, here in uh, very blue California, my major issue is Medicare for All. I was lucky enough to get on it two years ago after being denied uh, for a lot of things. I'm a cancer survivor. Anyway, uh, Nina, thanks for the wonderful hug. I got to speak at Bernie's thing at, in Little Tokyo. And um, also, what I've noticed is all my letter drops to uh, uh, Feinstein regarding Medicare for All, the, the person comes down to the law. She says, oh, well, uh, Senator Feinstein doesn't support it. And, and uh, Kamala Harris supported Bernie's uh, proposal initially, and then she started walking it back. And uh, I have a Congressman, Tony Cardenas, that's just like the worst. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and then my... Oh, Mark, you keep freezing. Or, oh, sorry. My state senator, uh, uh, Robert Hertzberg, said, oh, we can't do that now, not with Trump in office. And, and it just drives me crazy. How do we turn the heat up to really make these people take notice? And if we can hold, we got two questions then. One, general what to do for man, and then the Medicare for all focus, including with obviously, you know, two moderate and two conservative Democratic elected officials. Let's hear from Sharon again. People try to keep your comments brief. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm a national delegate and I did sign the pledge to vote against the platform. Um, I do have some discomfort with that because I think there is some very good stuff, anti-war stuff, climate change stuff. I don't want us to be demonized. Um, so maybe we could speak to that. And one more thing, I think we need some new polling on, on uh, support for Medicare for all. Well, in regard to the petition, I understand your concern, um, but the reality is this is a protest vote. We don't actually have the numbers at this point to overturn or reject the uh, platform outright, um, but it's important for us to take a stand. Where do you draw the line? Are we going to keep moving that line? Uh, mm -hmm. we, we just can't keep doing that. If we keep moving the line, then we're never going to get there. We have to draw it somewhere and we have to stand for something and we have to be a show of force and really, really launch an effective protest. And this is one way to do it. Now, I'm not going to say it's impossible because our numbers are getting higher and higher. Those signatures are growing and maybe we will get there. Um, that would be incredible to me. I don't think we're giving up anything because that platform is is supposed to represent the values and principles of the people. It's not supposed to be molded to the position of the candidate. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been doing. We need to get past that attitude. Oh, so God. even though there is some progressive language in that platform, it doesn't bind any candidate. It doesn't force them to adhere to that platform. There's, there's no real accountability. It's just a statement. So that statement should reflect our principles and the things that are important to the, to the, to the people of this country. We can't keep moving that line to accommodate anyone. There it is. And, I, and I'm, I'm glad she brought that up because I, I know a lot of people are probably feeling that way, not to want to be demonized. Well, the other side needs to feel that way. Too. There's so much suffering going on in this country. They're the ones who should that way. The overwhelming majority, I, I don't, and I don't think what other poll do we need? Millions of people. There are almost 90 million people in this country who are either underinsured or uninsured. And that was before COVID. That's our poll right there. That's the poll. So we need these elected officials to do, Lord have mercy, 
We need these elected officials to do the right thing on behalf of the people and not just the donor class. This is ridiculous. But my sister, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people feel like that. As the chairwoman said, this is a protest vote. We are drawing the line in the sand and we are showing whose side we really are on. It is the platform is non-binding, so it won't hurt anybody for them to stand. Um, now, I, I can't get all those questions. Almost 9:30. I got a sister got a 10 o'clock. Now we gotta wrap this on up. Yeah, we, yeah, no. I, the one thing, though, I thought was interesting, too, from the earlier two questions, though, is, you know, how do we proceed? How do you, both of you, and, you know, uh, see, see us proceed? What else can we do? Besides yeah, but also, if we, especially if we have a Democratic administration, how do we, as progressives, push, you know, how hard do we push all that kind of stuff? So take it away, Dr. Dewey. Uh, well, I was just going to say regarding the first question that you can be the next Cori Bush, you can be the next Rashida Tlaib. Um, and so just step out of your comfort zone. And if you feel like uh, you are somebody who, who shares a belief as, as do most of your neighbors and the people of your community, um, there's a lot of organizations like yours that will help you achieve your goal of being that change. So yeah. you can run for something. Yeah, and you know, look at what's happening in Nevada. I mean, what uh, the chairwoman and, and other progressives in that state what they are doing shows us that we can win what our sisters and brothers in California just did to demand that Congressman Ro Khanna, for example, be the chair of the party. That was totally not going in that direction, but they took a stand, they made a demand, and they were gonna back that up by saying, we vote no. If it's not Congressman Ro Khanna, well, guess what? We out. And they, the, synergy, the energy that they had because Senator Sanders absolutely won that state as the wind to make that demand. And they didn't shrink from that demand. They didn't think about the what ifs and, and what the other, oh no, baby. We are going to vote no on anybody whose name is not Ro Khanna in the great state of California. And out of that, not only did they win, but two other people were added to that. And that's Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Miss Solis. So that just happened recently. Just one of many examples to show what we can do. We got our brother Bowman in New York. You know, a whole bunch of examples that we can give that when progressives take a bold stand and make a demand, as brother Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. We got to be willing to make a demand. We are on the right side of history. Don't let these people tell us that we are not. We are. We're right. We perfect, but we're right on the right side of history. Um, and, and so Senator Attorney, we do, you do have to leave in a few minutes. What should we do? We have about 12 people. Should we sell it, say just 30, 10 seconds each and throw out a yeah, question? Let them, let them get it in. I mean, a lot of people are, you know, it's late on the East Coast and I do yeah. have a 10 o'clock. Yeah, let's let them get it in, but they gotta do it quickly. We love y'all, right. we're gonna do another one. Marlene, you're up. <laughs> okay, one of the real important things we need to do is stop letting Biden um, pull the wool over people's uh, eyes, heads with the term uh, universal health care. That's code for how much and what quality of health care can each person afford. And the Dem delegates, the Bernie delegates need to do like we did in 2016 with some kind of a sign during their Zooms, that it, same kind of a sign that explains that, that universal health care is code word for how much and what quality can each person afford. You need Thank you, Marlene. Lee Stanfield's up. Um, Lee Stanfield? Yes, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, racism is greatly increased whenever there's a lot of financial stress and Medicare for all would, especially HR 1384, is the only bill that will greatly affect the financial well-being of every person in the U.S. So it is an anti-racist action on a nation nationwide scale. And it's the only bill that is. Thank you so much, Lee and Mark Skogman. You're up. Continue our campaign for Medicare for All. Uh, what should we do uh, about Medicaid expansion in the states that have not taken the Medicaid expansion? Um, Nina Turner. Any thoughts? Yeah, we got to put some pressure on the state elected officials. 
officials and these governors. I mean, it's the same thing that we always do, but we have to localize it. And so I want to share something that Michael Rinder, aka Killer Brain, said when we were on a call last night. Um, plot, plan, organize, strategize, mobilize, and he's adding to his list, capitalize. And so that is what we're going to have to do. Plot, plan. Doc, can you type that in for me? Plot, plan, and give credit to Michael Render, a.k.a. Killer Mike. Plot, plan, organize, strategize. I should have had Mike do that. Uh, Dr. Dooley, I'm sorry I ain't putting you to work, damn it. Sorry. Plot, 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 plan, organize, strategize, mobilize, and capitalize. We need to take what Michael Render said, AKA Killer Mike, and do that on every single level of government. Shame on any governor and legislature that is not willing to expand Medicaid. Got to do it. Plot, plan, organize, strategize, mobilize, capitalize. We same pressure on these people that we do on the federal government. Um, Carol C. Readings, and then it's going to be Kate LaRose, and then Lorena. Go for it, Carol C. Readings. Hi. Uh, sorry about the. Uh, this is Carol Christensen, and I want to say that I struggle when we go off on tangents, when we want to backtrack and talk about single-payer health care. We have a product that we can get behind and support. It is Medicare for All. It is organized. It has been proven to cost less. And by the way, we can't get distracted by people throwing up arguments about how much it's going to cost. We've already got those answers. So what I say is my frustration is the past 50 or 60 years has been spent by the GOP and the Koch brothers making the reality we have today happen. <clears throat> we need a strong core group that counteracts that with the strong messages so that we have the response to ridiculous questions. Medicare for all is the single gateway issue that unites all of us. And it doesn't matter how dis detractors throw up obstacles in our way. We just have to organize people. We need to talk to them with deep canvassing. We need to talk to our neighbors and I'm sure all of you agree, but I, I, here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, we are focusing on single, on Medicare for all by making, getting yard signs. We have just ordered 500 yard signs and we're gonna get them out there. Our dream is to coat the state with Medicare for all yard signs. And we encourage anybody who likes this idea. So we want before the November election, for the elected officials to see where the people stand. They, I want them to see yard signs everywhere. Thank you so much, Carol. That's Thank you for the message. Can I just say, can I just say something real quick about that? I, sure. I, understand, I understand what you're saying, but one of the reasons um, when we talk about it, we use all of that language by saying uh, Medicare for all single payer health care system. And the reason we do it is because during the debates, um, you notice Pete Buttigieg and Biden both were calling it Medicare for all who want it. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have to distinguish as to what that means. And when we talk about Medicare for all, um, that is a single payer healthcare system. That's exactly what it is. And the current Medicare program has to be improved and expanded um, for any of this to work. So uh, I understand your concern but that's why we use the language we do about Medicare for all single payer healthcare system. Um, yeah, I'm actually gonna chime in for a second and say that too, that I really was very, very happy that Bernie Sanders always held the line that there would be no private insurance other than for like cosmetic concerns because in our education system, one of the reasons public schools are so defunded is because they're private schools. Rich people buy education that's quality and then the public education system gets defunded. If rich people had to send their kids to public schools and it wasn't based on property tax, it was all distributed equally, you'd have a much more balanced education system in the United States of America. And with healthcare, if rich people can only get healthcare through the same insurance as everybody else in the United States of America, we're gonna have ACEs healthcare here. So thank you so much, uh, Judith and 
Farrell, sorry to break in there. And let's go to Kate and then Lorena, and I won't do that again. Kate, take it away. Hi, this question is for Senator Turner. As delegates, we're being told that we need to respect the lead of campaigns, and it's being suggested that voting against the platform would disappoint Bernie. However, it feels to me like our accountability as delegates runs deepest for voters rather than to campaigns, and voters clearly, desperately, passionately want Medicare for all. What advice do you have for those delegates among us who are struggling with signing this petition for fear of disappointing? Not me, us. <laughs> I've actually not encountered that obstruction whatsoever. And I've had numerous conversations with Bernie's staff. Um, in fact, um, my indication is that they will not step in and try to interfere with this, uh, with, with what we're doing. Now, whether that actually ends up being the case or not, we'll see. But none of, that, none of us have been um, told that we should not do, be doing what we're doing. I haven't encountered any obstruction or resistance to um, this petition. I'm sure that some state delegations have, but um, I don't know who's who's actually giving them that hard time. Um, yeah, we Kate, you get a cold star for a very concise and important question. So that was, I applaud that. Um, uh, Lorena, you're up. So my question is for Nina Turner. I'm a big fan of yours and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I want to know, are you considering running 2024? Lorena, but you did put me on the spot. I, <laughs> I, a lot of people have been getting that for a very long time. There's a Facebook page, Nina Turner 2024. Uh, people from Nina Turner sprouting up. Um, an official group will be sprouting up here soon. I don't been hearing things about that other group on Twitter. You know, I, I may run again for something I was, who knows, we will see. Um, right now, my major focus is to do what I can where I am with what I have available to me to be able to use my voice and be in this movement, to be able to even try to move people who don't necessarily agree with us. That's where I wanna use my gifts for now, but I am going to continue to be in this space as long as the good Lord gives me breath. And I just want to thank you and so many other people who are not necessarily on the Zoom call with us for just really believing in my leadership in that way. Um, I will hold every opportunity to run again. Uh, every opportunity is open. I'm open. So that's my co politically correct. I must admit I'm trying to be politically correct right now. Um, but I'm not sure. No, let me just say that I'm not, I'm not really sure what the, the whole the terms of me running again, but any office, I will not about the run of any office at this point in my career. I will say Michigan is just north of Ohio. I live in Michigan. Senator Turner lives in, lives in Ohio. And I believe by 2023, it should be safer to go out. So if two of her biggest fans, being myself and my significant other, have to drive down to her house every day with some picket signs, encouraging her to run, that, that's what we will do. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> um. Yeah, thank you. And um, and so up next are going to be Terry, Cody, and Luke, and that's it. So we're, we're almost done. Thank you, by the way, Dr. Dooley and Senator Turner for staying long, and Judith Whitmer, of course. So Terry, Cody, and Luke, take it away, Terry. All right, I'm Terry Siegel. I'm a steel worker out of East Chicago, Indiana, okay? And uh, also a member of uh, PDA k Region. And uh, I just want to give a little shout out to... Uh, Nina and Bernie, you've done a great job. We appreciate you. And it's time for some good trouble, okay? And we gotta keep that mantra up, okay? So now mm -hmm. it's time to go educate and organize. And we gotta go out there and find a broader base of people to support Medicare for all. Good example is farmers who are typically Republican. They need to understand they need health care. They're gonna lose their damn farm. Yes. Another one is attorneys. What the hell's wrong with these people? They need health care. They're always trying to milk the system someplace else, trying to milk for off of some municipality or something to get health care. You know, they need to wake up. So these professionals that think they're professionals need to realize they need to support Medicare for all. And we all need to support Medicare for all. And then on top of it, the unions need to realize they need to support Medicare for all because we're getting hammered every negotiations over health care. Come on. Okay. And 
Uh, thank you, Terry. Really now, appreciate before, it. Before we go to the next person, I just want to say what Terry said. You know, I had the opportunity to visit farms on the campaign trail uh, along with Senator Sanders and exactly what That's Terry really what Terry is saying is absolutely true. And so that was in both South Carolina, you know, when we were going through Iowa, our sisters and brothers on farms, you know, being told that one spouse, you know, if they had a spouse had to work a regular job so that they could provide health care and then come home from that job and also work on the farm, destroying small family farms. And that cuts from Iowa to places like South Carolina, where we have both white and African American and Latino farmers, farm, absolutely right. This is a critical issue. And I, I remember hearing when the farm, when, when the farmers went to lobby the Congress, it, it might've been in 2018, but anyway, it was determined that the number one issue that they wanted to talk about was indeed healthcare because they understand that they are a small business and they need that. And so we do have to talk about this issue and speak the love language of the people. And that is why I am trying very hard to stop the habit of saying who's a Republican, who's a Democrat, who's up, who's down, because Terry is right. Farmers tend to lean more conservative, but when you start to have a conversation about why Medicare for all is important to them, why it would matter to them and their livelihood, people get that kind of thing. So I believe that we can build a very broad coalition of people who just absolutely want to do the right thing on this issue. And I am really proud of the progressive movement for taking the lead. And we have to be open in our hearts and our minds to ensure that other of our sisters and brothers who may not agree with us on any other issue, but they agree with us on Medicare for all, that we welcome them all in. Thank you. Um, so Cody Hunter, you're up. Okay. Um, I'm a graduate teaching assistant in South Carolina. Um, we obviously have to get healthcare um, to teach. We get subsidized healthcare through the university, but in South Carolina, like the rates are just so high. Even our subsidized insurance is incredibly high. And on a GTA salary, that is uh it makes a huge, huge dent. We just had to sign a waiver to accepting liability if we return to campus for if we get infected with COVID that is on us at that point, which like we're young, we don't really have a viable excuse in the university's um, uh, book for not coming back to campus. And I know that I've tried to do a little bit of organizing with the Poor People's Campaign and one of my friends that sent it out in a mass email took my name out of it because there's such a fear of administrative uh, retaliation that it's really curbing organization work on campus. What advice do you have for students that are just kind of crippled by fear of administration that is ready to just crack down? And we saw what happened in Santa Cruz with the wildcat strikes and all of those graduate teaching assistants getting fired. So there is just kind of a, a morale that's been killed and we have a big Confederate organization right in our area. So we've got that pushing up against us too. So what recommendations do you have for us? <laughs> yeah, I'm very sorry to hear that. I mean, we got to build coalition. Mm -hmm. That's what you guys need. You need some people to have your back. And so please share your contact information and hopefully organizations like PDA Roots Action, Our Revolution, some of our big brother, big sister organizations can stand in solidarity with you. The students, we need some co-conspirators on this. It's just breaking my heart, really. I'm, I'm just holding back the tears right now because it is really a, absolutely a damn shame what you are saying. Last time I checked, Young people get prescription drugs too. The last time I checked, young people die and have health concerns. We saw that Brother Agnew shared that even at 37, he has high blood pressure. Life happens to us all. And for any administration of a university to say to young people that you can come on in because you are younger, it, it absolutely makes no sense. I hope all of our sisters and brothers who are still on this call, and the overwhelming majority of me, I think, Alan, we were up to almost like almost close to 300 people at the height of this call. And we still got about 150 people still left. I wanna thank you guys for spending your Wednesday night with us. I want you to know how important this issue is and the fact that we are willing to come on this call in solidarity and that people are telling real live stories that is happening to them. What our sister Cody just said, everybody should be up in arms about this. 
this should not happen in the United States of America, quite frankly, in the world. Right. But in the United States of America, especially to hear these kinds of stories, it is criminal. As one of our brothers laid out earlier, it is criminal and it is immoral. It is unacceptable and we can't keep taking it. And then they want to talk about subsidizing COBRA. I had to write that down. You know, Dr. Dooley talked about that. I want to tell you something. As somebody who worked for the Sanders campaign and when that campaign shut down, yours truly, meaning turn, and my family, like everybody that was still in that campaign, it's about 600 of us, had to go on COBRA. And do you know how much COBRA cost Oh. For my family, just two people, my husband and I, two thousand freaking dollars Woo! a month. And thank God the campaign subsidized one half of that through October. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Yeah, yours truly, Senator mm. Nina Turner. So when I speak to you, look, I, I didn't I didn't wake up this way. I've been through a lot in my life, and we we're not gonna tell this whole story, but this just recently happened that I, mm. along with other people on that campaign, two thousand damn dollars a month for Cobra. It is cost prohibitive and it is killing people literally cannot afford COBRA. So when you got elected officials up there talking about subsidizing COBRA, all they doing is subsidizing the very healthcare um, uh, insurance companies because we ain't got no healthcare system. This ain't a system of care. This is a system mm -hmm. of insurance companies. A system of extortion. That's all it is, Dr. Dooley. And I'm over it. You know what I mean? Over it. And thank God the campaign is subsidized half of that through October 31st. $2,000, sisters and brothers. Think about somebody that got a bigger family. I mean, we do have a bigger family, but our son is grown, so he's not on. But just think about that. And that, Lord, don't even get me started. Alan, go on and get the other two people, because sister, got I got to be with Katie Halper at 10 o'clock. Right. Katie's great. She's the greatest. Hey, shout out to Katie. <laughs> um, Luke Barber, and then Samia, you're the very last. So Luke, you're up, and then Samia, and Cody, thank you, and solidarity. So much solidarity, Cody. And Luke, take it away. Um, mine's actually more of a statement than think. Uh, but uh, the state of Missouri, uh, 39 states have passed Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. Missouri uh, could be the next one here on August 4th. Uh, they just put the fiscal note attached to our um, ballots initiative. Um, and even our state government is saying that they're expecting a 6.4 million cost one time and then annually, they're saying um, increased costs of 200 million to a savings of 1 billion. So they're saying that it's going to cost them 200 million, but then they're going to save 1 billion with it. So that's some of the fiscal note stuff that we can see. Um, last year in 2019, um, I was cut from Medicaid for three months, had to sue the state to keep my insurance. Um, cause our state used Fortran computing system, which is a computing system that was built in the nineties. It's an IT infrastructure that was built in the eighties. And, and so it did not cross reference the federal eligibility lists for, uh, supplemental income, social security or SNAP. And so a hundred thousand kids were cut off Medicaid last year. Oh, no. Um, and they still have not gotten all reinstated and that's in the state of Missouri. Um, as a result of what's been going on in our state um, and seeing what sort of the Sanders movement has done, I actually decided I can do something about this. So I put my name in the hat in March, literally the day of the primary, the day, literally one day after the primary, when we saw Biden win over Sanders in Missouri, I decided to throw my name in the hat for state representative at the state okay. level government. Yay! Uh -oh. um, yeah. I think Luke got muted. Um, Luke, why don't you just finish up just quickly with what you're saying? Sorry. I didn't and, so, and so what I'm saying is if Missouri becomes the 40th state, that's 40 states with Medicaid expansion. That leaves only 10 states left. And, and we know that Medicaid is not the same as Medicare because Medicaid is... Um, more state level versus Medicare is more federal level. But 
with Oklahoma, that's 39 states, 39 out of 50. So the, the verdict's basically out. Almost 40 states have said, we want this insurance. Um, it certainly represents an appetite for Medicare for all, as do all the polls as well, too. But I think even with Medicaid expansion, there's a gap that does exist, right? Um, so, you know, people make income and then they fall into the gap and then they have to go buy insurance off of COBRA. So they game it so much. Thank you so much for that. Samia, you have the final word and then we're going to wrap and let's try to get out of here in a couple minutes. Take it away, Samia. Thank you, Luke. Um, uh, Mike Hirsch, can you unmute Samia? Can, no, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for taking my call. I just want to tell all of you that you, you revived my spirit and my belief in humanity. It's been really hard to, to see how the censorship has played out uh, uh, during the platform committee. And um, as a Palestinian American, I, I can tell you I'm, I'm devastated as a delegate. Our voices were not heard. I'm an activist here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I am also, uh, I played a big part of the Poor People's Campaign here. I know all too well what poverty does, what the health uh, risks are for impoverished communities, especially during this pandemic, and especially the indigenous communities that have taken a, a toll that, uh, ethnic cleansing kind of toll. Uh, my question to you is, we understand that the, the this conference, like, no other conference has been able to control the buttons literally on all the delegates. How can we, as a movement, you said coalition building, Ms. Turner, how can we build all those voices and kind of uh, build the infrastructure to chart the pathway forward the next four years? During this convention, we didn't get our way on the platform committee, but how can we build the coalition right now? Tell us what that protest is gonna look like where we can build all those voices that are for Medicare for all, all the movements really do the outreach. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Samia. Take it away, Senator Turner. Hey, Sister Samia, I, it, we're starting right now. I mean, what, what the chairwoman is doing in Nevada and bringing in all of the Bernie delegates and delegates just, uh, at Alan's point about the delegates is that there were only two candidates really competing very hard to get delegates in the end. And so by virtue of the numbers, just numerically, Senator Sanders and Vice President Biden will have the most delegates, even though we're trying to get if any of the other candidates have them, we want them. But Sister Smith, it, it is, we got to think beyond this convention. You're absolutely right. The, the, the push to make sure that Israel recognizes the humanity of our Palestinian sisters and brothers. They voted that down. They voted down legalizing marijuana, Medicare for all, uh, defunding the police, which does not mean abolish the police. I mean, Jesus, Alan, we got to do this again. I, what I'm Don't get weary and well-doing. We got to organize beyond this convention. This is only one step. And we got sisters and brothers who want to fight within the party. Thank God for people like a chairwoman Judith. And then we got others of our sisters and brothers who like them exit the hell with the party. We fighting on the outside. We need both of those forces. We need the yin and the yang. And so I don't want people to get discouraged just based on, I mean, you can be mad as hell and you can be discouraged for a little while. I'm not going to tell you don't feel those things. But I want to say that in your feeling of anger and discouragement and people who have the power held, you know, one to nine and you still putting the hammer down on people. What kind of nonsense is this? This democratic convention is only one part of it. So we're going to show strength by what sister Judith is doing. And then I think it was sister Nancy that was saying people need to have up signs and let's show some solidarity as visually as we can in a virtual convention. They lucky that this convention is virtual. I tell you that they really, really are. They get in the way with they lucky because if people could physically go there and show the way we show strength in 2016 and even more so now, we're more mature, we're four years more mature than we were in 2016. We are going to continue to grow. We're gonna have some mountaintop moments and we're gonna have some valley moments. And right now that platform committee showed very much a valley moment, but we can't stake every position and every move we make cannot be based on what the DNC does and does not do. We the people, conscious minded people, getting out there organizing, plotting, planning, organizing, strategizing, mobilizing, and capitalizing, baby. They gonna continue to feel our power and our strength. Alan, I want Dr. Dooley to get in. You talked about that Medicare 
um, uh, the, the Medicaid expansion. And Dr. Dooley talked a lot about this on the campaign trail as to why, although we need that expansion, it is not, it cannot fulfill the needs of Medicare for all. And she talks about it on how it is a system that separates the poor, like really the haves from the have not, it stigmatizes people even though I understand what Brother Luke was saying. But Dr. Dooley, can you talk about that a, a little bit? I know I've got 10 minutes and counting. But... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So in the United States, we have this tiered system of healthcare. And basically, it allows the healthcare system, your providers, to your hospital, to judge your worth. If you have a PPO, whatever, you get your, your life is worthy if you can afford the deductibles. If you have an HMO, your life is worthy, but it comes with all these restrictions because you have networks, you're gonna need a referral, et cetera, et cetera. If you have Medicaid, your life is, yeah, it's a little bit worthy, but there's even more restrictions than there are for an HMO and everybody knows that you're poor. So it's like the Scarlet M on your chest, Scarlet M. Nobody should know how much money your family makes or, or be able to estimate it based off some damn words on your insurance card. That is not healthcare justice. See, I trained and plant some of the babies that I helped deliver were subsequently poisoned by lead water. And so what do we do? We get the, we get the Medicaid, but Medicaid restricts where they can go for treatment. There's some doctors that don't accept Medicaid. And again, and if they do accept Medicaid, it tells whoever's at the front desk, oh, but this is a low income family. So Medicaid, yes, is better than nothing, but it is not true healthcare justice. True healthcare justice means Anybody can go to any doctor they want to, and that the doctor and their staff not have to judge them, but also make medical decisions based off of the words in their card. Because there are certain things, certain tests, certain uh, medications that I cannot prescribe to you based off of whatever type of insurance you have. So basically, if you have Medicaid, my hands are going to be tied to as far as what specialists I can get you to, what medications I, pres I can prescribe you. So our whole system is set up to be discriminatory. And that is not the way it should be. That is not healthcare. We should not be able to discriminate against individuals based off of basically some words on their healthcare card. So that is why Medicaid is an insufficient solution expanding Medicaid. We should not be having people um, labeled as low income and we should not restrict people's choices and people's treatment options simply based off of their income. You better talk about that. Alan, I, I just want to read this quote. I'm going to get off of here. I don't know how we mm, close yeah. and whether uh, Luke wants to say something. I just got to say, this was so beautiful. I almost feel like we're in a physical space with each other. Um, PDA, our revolution, roots, action. Alan, did I leave anybody out? I, I just uh, thank Bernie, you all. Bernie for, Delegates uh, Network, but yeah, good. Oh, yeah. Me and D, how can I forget that? Or just bringing this, this family together. And I hope most of you feel renewed and you feel like you can carry on. This is a quote by Eugene Debs that uh, my dear friend Michael Render reminded me of. And this is it. While there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. What I am saying, sister, brother, that's brother Eugene Debs. Long as there are people suffering in this country, we are suffering. As long as there is a need for Medicare for all, baby, we will continue to push for it. As long as there is injustice, we will be on the side of what is just, what is right, and what is good. And I want everybody to know on this call that there were generations before us having the same fight, and they were called disruptors. They were called out of the mainstream. They were called radical. Don't think when they were fighting for Medicare as we Medi Medicare as we have it now that that wasn't called socialism. Come on, somebody. When they were fighting for Social Security and unemployment insurance. Hello, somebody. When the abolitionists were fighting, when Black folks were fighting to be free, somebody said that's going to upset the status quo. Baby. It don't get no more profound than that. This is a liberation movement, and we are on the right side of history, no matter what our friends and frenemies have to say about it, baby. If they're not willing to take a stand with all of this suffering that is going on in the world, in this country, the hell with them. We stand on the side of justice with some misfits, misfits like Mahatma Gandhi. Hello, somebody. Misfits <laughs> like Caesar Chavez, hello somebody. Misfits like Mother Jones and Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker and Daisy Bates and Booker T. Washington and Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and Shirley Chisholm and Barbara Jordan. Oh yeah, baby. 
We in good company. Frederick Douglass. All y'all shout out some misfits, baby. We are on the right side of history. And all of those Malcolm X and all of those freedom fighters that I just named in their day, they were ridiculed. He said that they were starting trouble. Even our beloved Congressman John Lewis talked about making good trouble, baby. So the more names they call us, the more on the right path we know that we are. Hello, somebody. Woo, woo, fire. Um, I want to thank Dr. Dooley, of course. Thank Judith Whitner. Thanks, Senator Turner. And I just want to say this. If Zoom had that little function like Facebook where you could throw the hearts up, and the, you, you, would, you wouldn't be able to see you at the end of that there, Nina Turner. So <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much. And uh, thank you, of course, to the PDA staff, Mike Kirsch, Mike Fox, everybody, Janice Kay. Thank you all. And Chairwoman Whitner, thank you, baby. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Love y'all. Love, love you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye. Love you all from South Carolina, baby. Love you, baby. <laughs>